Oh. What? I thought you weren't here yet. Okay, there she is. Snuck she snuck in. in. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Hey, you made a room. Welcome, everybody, to the Dr. and Mrs. Gary Brummer Colloquium Series in Psychology, the first one of the academic year. Uh, it's great to see faculty here, students here, a lot of uh, internal incentives for this talk for sure, <laughs> or maybe a little bit of extra credit here and there. Glad to see everybody. Uh, our first presenter for the series for this academic year will be our very own Dr. Patrick Cushion. Dr. Cushion is a, an associate professor in our psychology department at Murray State. His research centers around oops, problem solving and creativity, which we are going to probably hear a little bit about. Is it like a little bit? Dr. Cushion received his bachelor's degree from St. Louis University and his master's and PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is published in journals such as the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Journal of Learning and Individual Differences, and the Journal of Problem Solving. Um, so without fur further ado, I'll let Dr. Cushion take it away and just welcome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, all right. So uh, first of all, let me say just thank you for letting me come up here and actually talk a little bit about um, some of my research. This is the stuff that I often get most excited about and have been excited about for quite a while and hopefully uh, I can tell the best story about. So we'll see about that in uh, just a little bit. Um, but it, as uh, Dr. Jordan mentioned, I tend to, my central interests are in things like problem solving and in particular in things like creative problem solving um, but problem solving in general too I, I'm interested in how these things are similar how these things are different right um, and that's actually kind of going to be the template for what I want to talk about tonight um, I first want to talk about what I mean when I say that I'm interested in creativity, because that actually in the area of, or in the field of psychology can mean a whole bunch of different things. And I'm not interested in studying, for example, great creative geniuses. I just don't have the access. I can't go study, uh, you know, your, your fabulous musicians and your fabulous artists, but I can study kind of everyday creativity. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what it is that I study, how I'm defining creativity for the purposes of this talk. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I have looked at as predictive of it. And not just it, but also other kinds of complex problems, how it might be similar, how it might be different. And then I'm going to try to highlight a particular study, because I'm going to run through a whole bunch of pieces of evidence, and I'm not going to go into extraordinary detail about all of those pieces of evidence. I'm gonna show you what they are. But I'm gonna to try to highlight a particular study that was done, uh, that I did in graduate school that kind of, I think, puts a cap on everything else that I'll talk about tonight. And then we'll talk conclusions in future directions, which hopefully, if I've done a good job, will be very evident to anybody anyway. All right, so let me start off with this question of what is creativity or what do I mean when I say I study creativity? And let me just start by giving you a uh, problem that I've given people in a creativity study. This is a problem that's an example of what's known as an insight problem. Insight problems are problems that have a tendency to, when you give them to people and when they get the solutions to them, as opposed to like, let's say a math problem, where I give you a math problem and you do it and then you get the answer and you go, okay, right, I've done the thing. Creativity or insight problems in particular have this tendency to when you find the answer, it like surprises you. You go, ah, uh, a classic way of talking about this is as a eureka moment. I'm not expecting anybody to show eureka in this room, but they tend to have that kind of phenomenological experience that it's like a surprise and interesting and exciting that you've solved it. So here is an insight problem. Um, the triangle below, I mean above me, but below that text, 
right? The triangle points to the top of the page, to the ceiling of the room. Figure out how to move three circles to get that triangle to point to the bottom of the page or to point down. If it's helpful, you can imagine this as uh, like 10 coins kind of arranged in a triangle. Does that make sense? Right. I'm going to let you guys think about it for uh, a little bit. I'm not going to give you as long as I would give somebody in a laboratory setting simply because we can't take 10 minutes of my 45 or 50 minutes to let you solve this problem. So I'm going to say, I don't know, 30 seconds. This is my favorite part of the talk where I just stand here. <laughs> You took my problem solving class, and you know the answer. It doesn't count. All right, I know I'm interrupting some people's problem solving here, but let me just start by saying if you are like most people, you're probably looking up here. Is that true? How many people looking up there? Right. Don't look up there. Not going to help you. Most people, one of the other characteristics that insight problems have is that they tend to lead people to initially start looking in the wrong place for the answer. So they come in with an initially inappropriate way of, of approaching the problem. In this case, well, I told you to make this triangle point down, and because the top part of it is the most pointy uppy part of it, we kind of want to get at it. In order to actually solve this correctly, and I'm sorry, I am going to spoil the answer to this. If you don't want to see it, I guess look away. It well, I'm going to talk about it anyway, so whatever. Um, what you actually have to realize that is that it's these outside circles that are the most relevant. And once you realize that uh, an upside down and a right side up triangle will share the same central core, the only thing that will move is the outside, then you can actually get the answer, right? What we think in creativity research is that, at least for some of these kinds of problems, what they require is something like a change of representation. You're thinking about it one way, you need to fundamentally change the way you're thinking about it. That's part of what makes them different from, let's say, math problems, where you're not thinking about the math problem wrong when you're first tackling it. You just don't have all of the, the equations executed to get the answer yet. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Obviously, like I said, I am not, by giving people this, studying Mozart. Right? I am not studying uh, Van Gogh. I am not even studying you cutting your first album, right? Or your first mixtape, or drawing something really cool. Right? But I do think that I'm getting at something that's relevant for all of, all of those more complicated creative products, right? What we'll often talk about in creativity research is what's known as the distinction between little c and big c. Little c creativity is the kind of small, everyday creativity that might allow you to solve this problem. Big c creativity is starry night, right? So I think that the same stuff that's happening here is the same stuff that's happening when people are making a great artistic masterpiece or a great musical masterpiece, it's just maybe on a different scale, right? All right, does that make sense? Hopefully, all right. So, my question, and the question that I've been interested in since I got into graduate school was what enables this process? And a little bit of self-disclosure, part of the reason why I was interested in this is because I grew up as somebody with ADHD, right? And I was always told, having that diagnosis, that I'll have trouble paying attention and focusing and maybe doing kind of complex math problems because I'm distractible, right? But that maybe there's some other consequence of that. Maybe I'll be more innovative. Maybe I'll be more creative. And so when I actually got to the point where I was in college or in grad school and had the opportunity to see whether or not that was true, I was curious to find out if it was. Right. Turns out, 
There wasn't as much evidence for that as people were leading me to believe as a child. That's not saying that they were wrong. We'll talk about that in a second, but that was, they were maybe blowing a little bit of smoke for a little while. All right, but that leads me to my method, right? Which is I'm interested in these complicated things, but I'm interested in trying to predict them from less complicated things, right? I want to get very basic, very simple individual differences between people. Individual differences, maybe one of the worst terms in psychology. It's about the vaguest term you can find other than variable. Variable being things that can vary. Individual differences are, is ways in which individuals differ, right? <laughs> Terrible term, right? But what I mean when I talk about individual differences is I, as a cognitive psychologist, am interested in how people differ in terms of things like attention and memory, right? So where I'm going to start is in thinking about the influence of somebody's ability to control their own attention. That is to regulate their attention, right? So controlled attention, to the teacher and me can't help but put definitions and things before I move on, right? Controlled attention is the ability to attend to information that's relevant to the task or relevant to your current goal and ignore any information that's irrelevant to your current goal. So right now, presumably you're here, your goal is to listen and understand and learn or learn enough to be able to answer the extra credit assignment afterwards, right? But at some point, you're probably going to think about some other things. Did you close the door to the hallway? Because there's, a, there's noise in the hallway and that's a distraction. And so your ability to pay attention to me talking as opposed to the noise in the hallway would demonstrate some good control of attention. Make sense? And this is also a good place to start, right? A, because me as a child was told that I have bad this thing. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm curious about what that means, right? But also in cognitive psychology, we have loved the, uh, the invention and development of computers because it gave us a good analogy for how a brain works, right? Ever since the computer was developed in the mid 20th century, Right, we've started to ask the question of like, how is our brain like a computer? How is it not like a computer? And one of the ways in which we've tried to parse out how our brains work is by making computer programs that imitate how our brains work. And so lots of theories of problem solving, in particular, computer model based theories of problem solving really emphasize the role of controlled attention in problem solving. This is a thing that is gonna be really important you can pay attention to what you're supposed to pay attention to and ignore stuff that's not relevant to the task, you're gonna do better. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, well, that is incredibly true. Okay. Um, one of the ways in which lots of people will study controlled attention is by measuring a, an individual difference known as working memory capacity. This is ironic because this is literally what we just finished talking about in my learning and memory class here. So if you guys are here and I ask you to make connections to class, hopefully the connections are fairly obvious. Okay. Um, working memory capacity refers to uh, your ability or the amount that you can remember while concurrently processing something else. Let me give you an example task. This is going to be a theme. Let me give you an example task to explain what I mean. This is a task known as operation span. Here's how operation span works. I would give you an equation. I would ask, is eight divided by two plus six equal to 10? Is it? Yes, right? So what you would do is you would say yes, and then very rapidly on a computer screen, that, that question would pop up on a computer screen. You'd have to press a button. And then you would be presented with snow. Then after a very, very brief presentation, about a half a second, it would move on to the next one. Is four times three minus three equal eight? You would say no. And then it would flash road. And then you would get another one. Is four divided by one minus four equal to zero? Yes. You would see pile. And then at the end of that, all of those words would go away and it would say, hey, what were all of those words? 
right? So I'm asking you to remember information, snow, road, pile, while concurrently, while at the same time doing some other processing task. There's a bunch of advantages to this. It prevents you from being able to rehearse the words because you're thinking about the math problems, things like that. Right? But really, it's getting at, can you keep information in mind while you're doing other stuff? Okay. And there is, at this point, lots of research that suggests that how well you do on this doesn't have anything to do with just like the fact that your brain is bigger and you can pack more words into it, but how well you can control attention. Can you ignore distracting information? Can you, for example, forget all of the information that was in the equation before because you don't need to remember that? Can you hang on to the words and keep hanging on to the things you're supposed to hang on to? Ignore the other stuff. Make sense? Hopefully. Okay. All right. So, we know that that measure, that individual difference, is extraordinarily predictive of performance in a lot of complex tasks. Uh, anybody that's taken my problem solving decision making uh, class probably hates the fact that I put this up here because I do not shut up about the Tower of Hanoi. Right? But the Tower of Hanoi is maybe one of the most widely used simple tests of problem solving in computer science and uh, cognitive psychology simply because it's very easy. It's very simple, it's a limited task. It's the task as uh, normally written or as like kind of its classic formulation is, you've got three pegs, peg A, B, and C, and you've got a anywhere between like three and well, up to a lot of disks, right? And the pegs, the disks kind of have holes in them so they fit on top of the pegs. You know that children's toy where you've got like different sized donuts that you put onto, uh, onto a peg, it's like that. Right? And your task in the classic version of it is to take that stack of disks that's on you know, peg A here and move it to peg C with a few rules. One rule is that you can only move one disk at a time. The second rule is that uh, smaller disks, or sorry, larger disks can't be placed on top of smaller disks. Does that make sense? I'm not going to make you guys solve this because it will just this one, this four disk version, takes, I, I think, 15 moves. The number of moves it takes increases exponentially as you add more disks, right? To the point that it very quickly becomes like hundreds, thousands of moves, right? But there is a strategy that you can learn, and there is a reliable way of solving this problem, right? So, being able to execute well on this problem requires you to be able to learn the strategy, be able to follow through on that strategy exactly, and so it's the kind of thing that we would expect working memory capacity, controlled attention to be able to predict, and in fact, when you look at performance on this task and try to relate it to controlled attention to working memory capacity, there's a fairly strong correlation. So uh, this table here on the, um, on the horizontal axis is working memory capacity. Further right is more. That is better controlled attention, right? Further left is less. Uh, on the vertical axis here is time to solution, how quickly it took somebody to, in fact, solve a four disk version of this task. And what you can see, right, for those of you who have taken statistics, you can see that there's a negative correlation, right? Or, what I can show you, if you see that trend line right there, it's suggesting that the lower your working memory capacity, the, the longer it's taking you to solve. The higher your working memory capacity, the shorter it's taking you to solve. Almost everybody on a four disk version, especially if you have a physical version in front of you, almost everybody solves. The really interesting thing is how quickly people solve, how quickly they can execute on it. Right? And controlled attention is helping people execute on it well. Here's another example of a, uh, a problem-solving task. Though this one's gotten actually fairly wide use. This is a task called the Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices. This is, how many people remember uh, commercials from Lumosity like five to 10 years ago where they were saying like, do brain training games to increase your intelligence. You guys remember these? You ever heard these things? When they said, do brain training games to increase your intelligence, what they meant was increase your score on 
almost exactly this task, right? Or another version that's very similar to it called the BOMAT. It's a very simple task. The, the idea, uh, or at least it's simple in theory, at least in terms of the rules of it, there is a change that is taking place on the objects going across from left to right in this array. There's a change that's taking place on those objects going from top to bottom, right? Your job is to figure out what those rules are and identify the option at the bottom here that best fits into that missing slot up top. In this case, three? Three? Does that seem right? I'm asking you guys. What else? I just made the talk. Am I supposed to know all the answers? It is three. Because right? you've got a box. You've got things shrinking. You've got a change from, or sorry, you've got a change from rectangle to diamond to triangle going from top to bottom. You've got a change from larger to smaller going across from left to right. So you need to find a small triangle inside of a box. And that gives you three. All right? The box. And then, when you also measure people doing this task, so this is just one item of a 36 item task. The Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices is 36 items and it gets harder as it goes on. This is one of the early ones. Right. When you look at performance on that task and you relate it to operation span, working memory capacity, one of these measures of controlled attention, again, you see a relationship. In this case, um, you see a positive relationship. The more working memory capacity you have, the better your score is on Ravens. Right? So another complex problem-solving task that requires controlled attention. Right? So far, I'm screwed. Right? Because I've just showed you a whole bunch of tasks that require controlled attention, and I've been told my entire life that I don't have any of that. So what can I do? And that, that leads me to um, <laughs> the research that I feel vindicated about, which is that there are also certain kinds of tasks, particularly tasks that tend to get labeled with the creativity label, not insight tasks necessarily, we'll get to that a little bit later, but there are certain kinds of tasks that actually don't seem to benefit from control, from focus. Right? And here's one example. This is a task known as the remote associates task. It's first developed by a researcher by the name of Mednick in the mid 20th century. It's, it's gone through a number of revisions. Right? In fact, um, the one I'm going to show you is kind of a more uh, updated revision. But here's the task. Um, you are presented with three words, eight, skate, stick, in this case. And your job is to find a fourth word that forms a common compound phrase with all of those three words. That is, um, you know, like a eight ball. If ball worked, then uh, if ball formed a compound phrase with all of the other words, then that would be the answer. It doesn't. Don't get fixated on ball. It's not the right answer. Anybody know the right answer here? Figure. Figure is exactly right. The correct answer here is figure. Figure eight, figure skate, stick figure. Right? This task, the remote associates task, was designed it, with the intention of measuring people's ability to make remote connections or identify remote associates. Right. Figure is often not the first word that we would think of when we think of eight. We might think of seven. We might think of ball. Right? But in order to get to the correct solution for this task, you need to be able to identify these kind of distant connections with the word eight to find figure and to find that figure works for all of these. Right? Um, and what I'm going to argue, or what I've found in a number of studies, is that this task actually benefits from a slightly less controlled state of attention. You actually do better when you are less focused. 
right? How do I know that? Let me start with the, inc like the, the evidence that would be extraordinarily difficult to argue as uh, having any other explanation. You do better at it when you're drunk. Or I should say, mildly intoxicated, 0 .08, uh, 0 0.08 blood alcohol content, right? Achieved via the, the most scientifically prepared vodka cranberries. <laughs> right. But you get people slightly intoxicated, 0 .08. Right. What you see, first, if I give them a measure of working memory capacity, they vomit. Your ability to remember information while processing other information goes to the floor. And yet, your performance on the remote associates task goes up. Right? Uh, here's another example. Right? If you don't want to go through the whole rigmarole of uh, getting the institutional review board to allow you to get people drunk, which is actually quite a bit of a rigmarole, right? Another thing that you could do is something that, uh, that was actually motivated by an undergraduate where I, was a, where I was a graduate student, which was just, what if we just tell people like, to not take it so seriously? Like, what if we just tell people to think with their gut? I don't, it, admittedly, this is a little bit of a dated reference, but if anybody remembers Colbert back before he was a, a, a talk show host, back when he was actually on like, um, the Colbert Rapport, he was doing this character who would often be like, I don't think with my brain, I think with my gut. Right? So the question was, what happens if you tell people to just think with your gut? And what you actually find is that just a simple think with your gut instruction, uh, over here the, um, the dark bars are actually um, uh, the remote associates task. The lighter bars I haven't really talked about, but it's an artificial grammar task, another thing that seems to benefit from people not focusing and actually like kind of just allowing information to wash over them. Both of these, the participants did better when they were given a just think with your gut instruction instead of a like try and focus and not given a just like go with whatever you think kind of instruction. So instructions to spend less effort can sometimes help people do better on these problems. So, at this point, I'm a little mixed. Right? Me, personally, the person with not great controlled attention. Because in, on one hand, I've been told that there are a number of problems that controlled attention is very beneficial for. But on the other hand, there are a number of other kinds of problems, like problems that people often think of as creative that it might not be beneficial for. So I was fundamentally interested in this question. How do I resolve this? Is it helpful? How can I address whether or not controlled attention is actually beneficial for creative problem solving? Right? And what I have come to and hopefully I'll be able to convince you of in the second, in the back half of this, is that um, what we actually need for a lot of what we consider creative or complex problem solving is both. Right. Dual systems approaches are so hot right now in psychology. <laughs> Everybody's all about thinking of your brain as multiple systems interacting with one another. Right. And here's just another one. But I was on this before it was hot. <laughs> right? OK. Let me give you one example. Analogies. Right. An analogy right. is mentally aligning something you've already experienced, right, what you know, we in the analogy biz call a source, with something that you're trying to, to do right now, or some information that you're consuming right now, a target, right? With the goal being that you can use something from your source, something that you've previously experienced to help you wrangle what you're dealing with now, the target, right? So for example, teaching. Analogies are everywhere because you're trying to introduce new concepts, but you're trying to do it by being like, okay, here's a concept you know already, so let me use that to scaffold what, you, uh, what I'm teaching you about. So, for example, um, 
pretty much everybody has a thermostat or is at least familiar with how thermostats in a house work, right? Thermostats, you set them to a particular temperature. If it's too hot, kicks the AC on. If it's too cold, kicks the heat on, right? Make sense? Levels too high, do something to turn them down. Levels too low, do something to turn them down. So I might use that when I'm trying to explain, let's say when I was teaching uh, physiological psych, how the pancreas works. <coughs> that is to say that if there's too much sugar in our blood, the pancreas secretes insulin to try to reduce our blood sugar levels. If there's not enough sugar, the pancreas releases glucagon to try to essentially pull sugar out of more permanent stores and make it available. Right. Now, if you misunderstood my analogy, and analogies can be difficult, they're, they're things that we know are related to um, controlled attention because one of the things that you have to do is you have to realize what's associated with what here. If you misunderstand my analogy, you might mistakenly think that the pancreas is related to heat regulation in our body. It's not, right? The analogy is more related to the fact that it's a, uh, it's a homeostasis system. If something is too high, it tries to make it lower. If something's too low, it tries to make it higher, right? That's where the analogy is at. So analogy, the, the idea of figuring out what aligns to what here is going to be a process that requires some kind of control, some kind of attention. You need to make sure that you connect this to this and not to somewhere else. So focus is going to be important. But also, we want to be able to make analogies between things that uh, we're encountering right now and things that don't seem particularly like them. The term for this is a, called a distant analogy. It's the idea that um, sometimes I can find things that have similar structure or similar rules or helpful information in experiences that don't look a whole heck of a lot like what I'm doing right now, right? And the funny thing about that is in order to be able to realize that something that doesn't look like what I'm doing right now is relevant, I kind of need to be a little scatterbrained. I need to be willing to entertain the thought of that thing. I need to be able to think about it, to be able to, be able to even recognize that it might be relevant. So it's possible that analogy is something that might benefit from focus in one aspect of it and less focus, less control in a different aspect of it. Right? So uh, here's a study that I did. Um, I gave people a problem. Here's the problem. It's called the radiation problem. It's a problem that's been around since, uh, well, before World War II, uh, run by a Gestalt psychologist by the name of Dunker. Um, here's the radiation problem. Suppose you're a doctor faced with a patient who has a malignant tumor in his stomach. It's impossible to operate on the patient, but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient will die. There's a kind of ray that can be used to destroy the tumor. If the rays reach the tumor all at once at sufficiently high intensity, the tumor will be destroyed. Unfortunately, at the intensity, at this intensity, the healthy tissue that the rays pass through on the way to the tumor will also be destroyed. Lower intensities, the rays are harmless to healthy tissue, but will not affect the tumor either. So what type of procedure might you use to destroy the tumors with the rays and at the same time avoid destroying the healthy tissue? When you give this to people, and especially when you give it to people who don't have a medical background already, so nursing students, pre-med people, they tend to have encountered this exact situation before, they get the answer. So if you screen for that, what you'll often find is people who try to use a really strong laser, but they try to do it in creative ways. They try to like cut a hole through a person. They try to say like, I don't know, can I just shoot the laser down their esophagus? It's like, no, you can't do that. Right. What you're really looking for is, well, actually the thing that is often done in medicine is what's called a convergence solution. Because what you can do is you can point multiple weaker lasers at the tumor that you're trying to destroy. Where they converge, their intensity will be high enough to destroy that. 
but anywhere where they're not converging, it won't damage the tissue. This is incidentally how like uh, laser surgery on brain tumors is conducted. They triangulate lasers so that they hit exactly the point you're trying to get. Right. Here's the thing. I've piloted, I ran a bunch of versions of this. When I give this to people without any prior story or prior knowledge, if I just give them this as a puzzle, about 0% of people give me this solution. Right? But if you give them a story ahead of time, even a story that's not related to uh, or that you don't tell them is related to the task, Right? You say, oh, we're going to do a reading task first, a reading comprehension task. And then you present them with a story about a lab assistant who's working with a light bulb, and that light bulb broke. And in order to fix it, they have to point three ultrasound machines at it. Well, now all of a sudden, you start to see more people generating that convergence solution. Not everyone. In fact, you get it to about 50%. Right? But then I came in and I asked the question, what predicts whether or not you're in that 50%? Right? Because I think it's going to be controlled attention and a little bit of uncontrolled attention. But I hadn't seen anybody study it yet. So, uh, okay, fair warning. I'm going to show a table, which I feel like is just a terrible choice on my part. Right? The table, this is for you grad students. Right. So what I did, I ran 120 people through, about 61% of them spontaneously generated the convergence solution after having been presented with like, a story that was relevant for the solution. Right. A story that didn't look like the radiation problem, but still held information that was important for it. Right. And what I did was a technique called a hierarchical logistical regression. I know, I see eyes glazing over already. Right. Let me give you the upshot of it. In a hierarchical log logistical regression, what you can do is you can plug in some things that you think are going to predict something. You could see how much they predict. And then you could plug in some more and see whether or not it predicts more. Does that make sense? Right. So here's what I got. In my first like block, to use regression terms. The first thing I did was I predicted whether or not you were likely to spontaneously generate this solution using measures of controlled attention, working memory capacity. I haven't mentioned this one, but anti saccade is a task where you flash something to one side of the screen and people need to not look at it and they need to look to the other side. Right? Just like fundamentally, like, don't look, look over here. Very hard, requires you to control, to like inhibit kind of in, uh, immediate prepotent responses. Okay. Also a measure of controlled attention. So my controlled attention, doing actually pretty good for a relatively complex uh, outcome, that is whether or not people spontaneously generate a solution that they are writing after having read something and read another thing. There's a lot of things that could go into whether or not you get the solution, but controlled attention is predicting about 25% of that variability. Not bad. That's pretty good. If I could predict 25% of your GPA, that would be amazing. Right? When I add in the remote associates task, remember a task that benefits from a little bit of defocus, it actually improves the amount of explanation that we have. And it's not a lot, but it's significant, meaning that there is some benefit to understanding what helps people do well in this task to measuring how well they're able to defocus or if they can do a task that benefits from defocus. Right. Does this make sense so far? Hopefully. All right. So what, uh, what I've got so far then is that I've got some evidence to suggest that these kinds of complex creative tasks will benefit a little bit from some control, but also might get some benefit from lack of control. Okay. And the last thing that I want to talk about, the, like kind of the capstone study here, is a thing that at the time that I first ran it, I didn't think people were paying attention to. And me talking to you now, several years after I've published it, I still don't think people are paying enough attention to, which is, what about 
how capable you are of switching between these things, right? Are you the kind of person who can turn off your focus and turn it back on again? Because I always thought that was my issue as a kid with ADHD. It wasn't that I couldn't focus on stuff because I could definitely zero in on some Garfield and friends, right? It was that I didn't have the ability to regulate. I couldn't choose what I was focusing on or what my state of attention was, right? So that makes me interested in bilingualism. Right. And you may be asking yourself, why? Right. Well, let me explain. Right. At this point, there is a lot of research to indicate that people who grew up speaking multiple languages have advantages in the flexibility of their attention. Right. I'll give you two examples, uh, um, well, two related examples. Um, one of the studies that shows this shows that uh, bilingual children are better than monolingual children. Bilingual just meaning that you speak two languages or more. Right? Multilingual would be technically the appropriate term for three or more, but you speak two languages, monolingual, you speak one language. Right? Uh, bilingual children, when you give them a figure like this, this is what's called an ambiguous figure. It's called the face-vase illusion or a figure-ground illusion. Right? Can you guys see, if you think about the black as a background, it kind of looks like a white vase. If you think about the white as a black around, a background, it kind of looks like two faces looking at each other. Over here is another example of this. This is the incredibly creatively named duck rabbit. And hopefully you can see that in one case you can interpret this as a duck. Right? Here's the bill. Here's the head. Or in another case you could think of this as a rabbit. Here's its little adorable nose. Here's its ears. Right? Turns out monolingual children very young monolingual children actually have a really hard time. You guys are all more than capable or should be more than capable of swapping between those interpretations. Very young children actually struggle a lot to swap between those interpretations. They see one, not the other, unless they're guided to. Bilingual children see both. Right? And they don't have trouble swapping between them. Right? Why? Well, they've got a lot of practice swapping between things, don't they? If you grow up bilingual, you learn that for, well, for most things, right? I mean, if you grow up English, Spanish, bilingual, and genes, or genes in English and los genes in Spanish, that's not super different, right? But for the most part, you find that there are different terms for everything. And not only do you have to grapple with the fact that anytime you see, like, a shoe, you're thinking of multiple different terms for that, but also which term is appropriate to use in the current context? Is my audience English speakers? Is my audience Spanish speakers? You have to learn to regulate that attention, and that develops control systems and control mechanisms earlier than just about anybody else. So we see um, bilinguals often having advantages in this kind of flexibility. Right? OK, so knowing that bilinguals seem to have advantage in the flexible control of their attention, I wanted to see, are they better at the kinds of creative problems that I think require sometimes control and sometimes lack of control? Does this make sense? Have I successfully brought you to this study? Right, wonderful. OK. So here's what we did. We recruited a whole bunch of participants. I did this study at the University of Illinois at Chicago. You may notice. About half of my, well, a little bit less than half of my participants, but like two-fifths of the people that I just spontaneously recruited were bilingual or trilingual or more. Right? This was extraordinarily common. Made Chicago a great place to do research on multiple languages. Right? Had a lot of monolinguals too, mostly English monolinguals. Uh, we measured language by just their self-report of uh, how early they started speaking multiple languages. So our early bilinguals are people who started speaking multiple languages prior to the age of six. 
right? Late bilinguals are like if you guys started, uh, grew up speaking English and then picked up Spanish in high school and then just got really fluent in it, you would count as a late bilingual. Right? And then what we did was we tested them on both creative problems, like the insight problem I showed you before, and non-creative problems, but matched for difficulty so that they were at similar levels of overall solution rate. Uh, participants solved three of these creative problems, three of these, uh, whoops, sorry, three of these non-creative problems, apologies, algebra. Right. Not all of them were algebra, some of them were um, like word problems, some of them were um, uh, comprehension and um, decision making problems. Right. But here's what we found. Averaging across all of our participants, we accomplished our goal. We found that the people that are, we found that on average, the creative problems were about as difficult as the non-creative problems, right? Cool, but hiding a very, very interesting effect. When we broke down solution rates by monolingual versus late bilingual versus early bilingual, here's what we found. Over here on the left are monolinguals. This red are the non-insight, the math and the reasoning and the things that I don't think were creative tasks that would require them to be focused and unfocused. Over here on the left in the kind of brown bars were the insight problems. Monolinguals generally were significantly outperforming themselves on the non-insight problems compared to the insight problems. But when you looked at early bilinguals, you see the exact opposite pattern, that they are overperforming on the insight problems relative to the non-insight problems. When you average all of these together, you get everything looking about equally as difficult, but it's hiding the fact that monolinguals are crushing the math and bilinguals are crushing the creative. Does that make sense? All right. So what does this mean? Well, like I said, I believed that there was going to be something important for the combination of being able to control and occasionally being able to be uncontrolled. Right? Bilinguals who seem to have this ability to be flexible, to go between different modes of attention, to direct their attention better than others, well, they showed an advantage for the kinds of problems that I expect that flexibility to have to, to be important for. Okay. Monolinguals, they did fine, it's just they did fine on the ones that didn't require that flexibility and did less fine on the ones that did. Make sense? Okay. So, so what does this mean? Does this mean that everybody should be bilingual? I mean, it wouldn't hurt. I'm actually pretty much, I'm a pretty strong advocate that bilingual education is pretty great. Right. But no, I mean, there's other ways that we could deal with this, right? There's other kinds of interventions that might also provide us with similar kinds of mental flexibility, right? So just to very quickly recap, because I am at exactly time at this point, right? Um, what we are interested in, or what I am interested in, is understanding the relationship between controlled and uncontrolled attention, effort, processing, right? whatever the, the, the term of the month is to refer to these things. I'm interested in how the combination of these things predict complex problem solving with the understanding that I think the combination of these things predicts complex problem solving. I think it's both, and I think it's our ability to do both or switch between them effectively. Right? Um, because, gosh, wouldn't it be awesome if I could figure out stuff that actually made us more capable of creativity? Wouldn't that be great? And wouldn't it be great if it wasn't bilingual education, especially early bilingual education, because you all might be sitting here going like, well, it's past that time for me. Right? Well, here's a couple of examples in, in my last minute. Um, one kind of experience that has been found to relate to similar advantages and flexibilities, multicultural experience. In fact, there is some argument as to whether or not 
Bilingual experience, like how can you separate bilingual experience from multicultural experience? Because they tend to be connected to one another. But you can stick monolinguals in multicultural situations and see their flexibility increase as well. Why? Because it poses similar challenges. You need to realize that, for example, leaving some food on your plate in some cultures is an indication that you are appreciative and that the, um, that the host gave you more food than you could possibly eat. While in other cultures it's considered insulting, as if you didn't like the food that the host provided enough for you to finish the meal. Right? Wrestling with that duality can cause you to be more cognitively flexible. Right? Another thing, do this in here for Dr. Bordieri. <laughs> Mindfulness. Mindfulness, if you're not aware with uh, what mindfulness is, uh, you know, talk to Dr. Bordieri after class. I'm just going to throw him uh, out there like that. No, mindfulness is. Uh, is a way, uh, particularly mindfulness meditation, is a way of thinking about your thinking that, is, um, that, is, that emphasizes kind of your control of identify your distractibility, but then stop being distracted and return to what you're supposed to be focusing on. And it turns out that kind of uh, meditation has been associated with both improvements in controlled attention and improvements in creative problem solving. So there might be something here as well. So maybe you can do this instead of learn a second language. All right. All right. And with that, I am at time and I am done. So thank you guys. No, actually, uh, that is a great question, um, and people have done exactly that research, and it does not matter. Um, multilingualism, uh, if one of those languages is sign language, it still has an impact. It still seems to relate. Now, there does seem to be an advantage to the relative interference from the different languages, and obviously sign language isn't quite as interfering with a, a you know, with like spoken English as, let's say, like, Spanish might be, but uh, it still does seem to have effects. Uh, it's like, you know, like I was saying, with early adopters, early bilinguals in sign language would show similar effects. Ooh, that's a that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so people have spent a little bit of time trying to parse out the unique effects of multilingual versus multicultural experience, um, and they do seem like they might be additive. So maybe you would you know you might get some stacking. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Wouldn't that be awesome though? I would love to be able to be like, all right, well, we're going to put you through this gauntlet of experiences and you're going to come out Van Gogh. That would be awesome. I would love that. Yeah. So could you use like bilingualism, like training or meditation to help kids with attention deficit disorders, like control their attention flexibility? That is a good question. Um, mindfulness meditation and ADHD. Some? Some, Not yeah. Super yeah. But so yes, people have tried that, right? And and uh, as you were saying, like theoretically, theoretically it should work. Whether or not it actually does, uh, I'm not a clinician, so I can't say uh, for certain. But um, but yeah. Yeah, mindfulness meditation has been, sh has, I, I think, it, I don't think I'm mischaracterizing it by saying a relatively robust history of emotional regulation and attention regulation improvement. So, yeah, I don't know if it would like counterbalance ADHD, but theoretically it should do something. Any other questions? I don't think that it matters, right? And I, and in fact, I think 
that the literature generally supports it. In fact, there are a couple of meta-analyses that look at first language, second language, and tend not to find any difference as a function of what the first or second language was, just whether or not you have them or not. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm confident that we had, at least in that last study where I had monolinguals, early bilinguals, and late bilinguals, like, especially a lot of those bilinguals were um, European bilinguals, so uh, international students or people, you know, just the, the uh, immigrant, children of immigrants or immigrants themselves who, because Chicago is a nexus, right? Um, and so often we had, that bilingualism is probably hiding a lot of trilingualism and multilingualism. Um, I don't think, at least I would have to go back and remind myself of this literature, but I don't think, you start getting diminishing benefits from bilingualism to trilingualism to multilingualism. Like there might be something there, but it's, it doesn't seem to be as big of an effect either in predicting whatever attentional benefits there are or in creativity uh, advantages. And at this point, I'm not the only person who has found these creativity advantages with bilinguals. Um, you, you see a big jump with bilingualism. You don't see as much with three, four, five languages. Yes, thank you for bringing me back to that. Um, yeah, so they were blowing smoke years ago, but it turned out the, the smoke was true. Uh, that we, we, have, we have since actually done those studies and found that there are patterns of um, if you give people with ADHD creative problems versus match for difficulty, like you see the advantage that people had told me for years might exist, but we didn't actually know it. So yes, you are absolutely right that there does seem to be something. So I wouldn't necessarily read too much into that. I, I know what you're saying. And when I first saw that, I was like, wait, are bilinguals worse at math? And I think that that's actually a little bit of a byproduct of just this difficulty matching. Um, if it's matched for difficulty across all peoples, and we expect that our bilinguals are doing better on creative than non-creative problems, then you're going to kind of by, necess by necessity pick um, math problems that are harder for them. So it's, it's, I tend to think of that more as just like a statistical necessity of that data than like a concerning trend or anything like that. Any other questions? I think we've got time for one more. Sorry, yes. So I know you find a difference between monolingual and early bilingual, but was there like a statistical difference between monolingual and no. Good question. Yeah. Late bilinguals seemed to fall right dead in the center, right? And if you actually look at that chart, right, they actually kind of look like, they almost look like the average.